It's quarter past, so we're going to start. Ready to start? Let's begin. Let's get going. I've been asked to introduce myself. Uh, I'm Don Curry. I'm a professor of Hebrew at BYU. And I do Book of Mormon research. I also do research on the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Book of Isaiah and other texts from the Hebrew Bible. So I think we, we had a prayer that began the sessions, I believe, so we're going to continue right now. I want to uh, discuss some items with you for about 30 or 35 minutes, and then I'll see if you have any questions, and perhaps give you some answers. Uh, I appreciate Carrie Mather, who's sitting here, who's going to run the PowerPoint uh, projector, and I appreciate her uh, putting it together. My wife is unable to join me and I will, I will miss her. I do want to share a cute story about Camille, my wife, and uh, she has given me permission to share this, and it deals with uh, words. I deal with Hebrew words, so I'm going to teach you something about an English word and show you how it can have more than one meaning. And I, as friends, went up to Idaho to meet my family and board members, and Camille told people, Don is a model husband, and that tickled me. Then we went down to Vegas, and we met her uh, ward members and her extended family, and she told people, uh, my husband is a model husband. We went back to BYU to a uh, uh, young married ward, and she did the same, model husband. And I was, I was feeling great about marriage until I looked up the word model in the dictionary. <laughs> said model, a cheap imitation of the real thing. <laughs> so uh, I deal with Hebrew words, and sometimes the Hebrew words have a couple of meanings. And we as scholars have to try to determine what the meaning, what the ancient prophets meant when they use certain words, and sometimes it's difficult. That's why we have so many different translations. That's one reason we have different translations of the Hebrew Bible. Or by Hebrew Bible, I mean the Old Testament. I am really amazed at the Book of Mormon's reading of what appears to be Hebrew forms, but translated into English. And I'm going to share some of those items with you today, some selections, just some samples. Hebrew forms that survive the translation into English. I will, I will remind you that he, uh, Lehi and his family lived in Jerusalem and it's, or, or uh, in the Jerusalem area, the greater Jerusalem, at the end of the 7th century BC. And Hebrew was spoken and written and read. Uh, Lehi, in my opinion, knew Hebrew and so did his sons and his wife and his kid extended family. I want to quote from Mormon, verse chapter 9, verse 32 and 33, Moroni wrote, We have written this record according to our knowledge in the characters which are called among us the Reformed Egyptian, being handed down and altered by us according to our manner of speech, and if our plates had been sufficiently large, we should have written in Hebrew, but the Hebrew hath been altered by us also. End of quote. There's a lot to be said about this quote, but I will not say it. Uh, I want to show you the PowerPoint. I'm going to simplify the language because there is some grammar, but I'm, I'm going to stay away from grammar because I want you to remain in the room. <laughs> so I'm going to simplify this and show you some forms that you grew up with if you've read the Book of Mormon throughout your life. Some forms that you've loved, but maybe you've wondered and puzzled about. and. So let's start with the first frame, and I think we'd be better off if we turn the lights off. Yes. Try the button on the bottom. Thank you. Is that better? Yeah. Okay, let's try that. And I'll try to stand. Does this work? Does this work? Yes. yes. 
But uh, it's kind of in one place right here. So, no, my mic is only for the camcorder. They told me, Don, that that goes into the other room. I don't know. They figured out how to cut it off. Oh, this does. Yeah. Oh, so we could share this presentation. With them. <laughs> I tried, but they complained. Did they complain? Okay. So I will not use that, but I want you to be able to see everyone over here. So. Uh, the name of the presentation, you already know that. And as I repeat, I teach Hebrew at BYU. I teach Dead Sea Scrolls Hebrew, Mishnah Hebrew, which is a Hebrew used by the rabbis at, at the time of Jesus Christ. And I teach Hebrew Bible, which uh, is the uh, Old Testament. The, most, most of the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, through Malachi. Uh, part of the book of Ezra was written in Aramaic, not to be confused with Arabic, and part of Daniel was written in Aramaic, and three words in uh, the book of Jeremiah are in Aramaic. I thought you'd want to know that. <laughs> this is, uh, uh, I just have two pictures of Hebrew to give you a clue and let you see what it looks like. This is the great Isaiah scroll that was discovered in cave number one in 1947. This is, uh, the cave one was the first yield of the Dead Sea Scrolls. So this is a complete scroll. It's a magnificent scroll. I've worked on this scroll uh, very closely for about seven years and produced a new edition of the Isaiah scroll that was published by a Dutch press. Uh, so Hebrew transcriptions and then uh, uh, translation. And some of the readings are unique and not found in our Bible. Uh, let's go to the next one. <coughs> this is a close-up of one of the columns of the Isaiah scroll. And I want you to know Hebrew is read from right to left. So go up to the upper right hand right there. So that's the first word. Kol, uh, uh, Omer, Kara. I won't read much of it, but uh, uh, you read it from right to left. And they don't have any punctuation, none whatsoever. In fact, they're lacking a lot of the vowels. You have to know how to read the text, the consonants, without the vowels. There, there's no versification, no verse numbers. That is a later invention. No chapters, uh, no capitalization. Even today, Hebrew does not use capitalization. So no capital letters. Even for important things like the name of God or the name of Jehovah or the name of Isaiah, no capitalization. So this is a uh, this is a close up just to let you see what Hebrew looks like. And I'm, I have one other, one or two other Hebrew things to show you, but I wanted you to see what it looks like. Let's go to the next one. What I'm going to do is, is show you some things that pertain to Hebrew and the Hebrew Bible, just for a few minutes. I'm going to tell you about a simile curse. A simile is a figure of speech that is used in symbols and it features the particles as or like. So I'm going to make up a, sim uh, a simile. I am as, well, actually not make one up, but, but to share one with you that you've heard. I, I am as hungry as a bear. You hear the word as? See, that's a simile. It's comparing two different things. Uh, he is as big as a dinosaur. See, hear the as? So a simile features as or like. So now what's a curse? A curse is where a prophet curses somebody. You know what a curse is. So a simile curse is a curse that uses a simile. Now what is outstanding about this is not only are they found in the Bible, but they're found in the Book of Mormon. And everything that I'm going to tell you will build upon the, build upon the case that Joseph Smith was a prophet and he indeed translated the Book of Mormon by the gift and power of God. So that's my overall goal is for you to see this. So here's a simile curse from 1 Kings. I, the Lord, will bring evil upon the house of Jeroboam he was a very wicked king, and will take away the remnant, remnant of the house of Jeroboam. Notice the as. There's your simile. As a man taketh away dumb, tell it be all gone. So, see, that's a curse. I'm going to curse him, and then it has a simile built in it. 
Here is another one. I will wipe Jerusalem as a man wipeth a dish, wiping it and turning it upside down. Jerusalem and its in the inhabitants of Jerusalem were very wicked, so the Lord is going to destroy. But he uses a figure of speech called assembly to demonstrate how thorough he will destroy Jerusalem. So, and how easily he'll destroy it. How easy, <coughs> easily will he destroy Jerusalem? As easily as someone takes a dish after they've eaten out of it, they wipe it out or wash it, rinse it off, and they turn it upside down so it will dry. Now that's very easy for me to do, and it was very easy for God to destroy Jerusalem. But you see the as. As a man wipeth the dish. So that's a simile curse. There are examples of simile curses in the Book of Mormon. Did Joseph Smith design it this way? No. The Book of Mormon came out of the ancient Near East and out of the biblical world. So they occurred naturally in the Book of Mormon. The prophets, Lehi and Nephi, brought that tradition with them to the New World. So let's look at an example. Uh, three examples in a row, all by Abinadi. It shall come to pass that the life of King Noah shall be valued even as, see there's your simile, as a garment in a furnace. So that's the curse. He's going to burn up. Number two, Abinadi promises that Noah shall be as, hear the as there, as a stalk, even as, again, the dry stalk of the field, which is run over by the beast and trodden underfoot. And the third one, all from Abinadi, thou shalt be as the blossoms of a thistle. So you, Abinadi, you're going to be like the blossoms of a thistle. You see the simile there and the curse. <coughs> Which, when it is fully ripe, if the wind bloweth, it will it is driven forth upon the face of the land. Now, you see how powerful this language is once you know what is happening. It's very powerful. And I would not want to be at the uh, receiving end of a simile curse from a prophet. <laughs> now, a prophet can curse someone without using a, a, a simile, but a, a simile makes it more poetic. And now you can visualize what is a garment in a hot furnace like? Well, it's destroyed in seconds, and that's how uh, Noah would be destroyed, and so on. Any questions on this part? Let's continue. Did I make it clear enough? Sure. Okay, next. Oh, prophetic perfect. This is, prophetic perfect means past tense. In English, we, uh, I'm simplifying this, of course. Past tense, I did something, I walked, I danced, I ate, I slept. Past tense. A prophetic perfect is where a prophet uses the past tense to describe a future event. So I've taken selections from Isaiah 53. So notice Isaiah, the first example, he, Jesus Christ, has borne our griefs and carry our sorrows. I think you're all familiar with Isaiah 53, so you will recognize this. But Jesus wouldn't live for another 700 years or so. But Isaiah used past tense. He, Jesus Christ, was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed. See, Isaiah is using past tense but it's a future event. Now, why would a prophet do that? We, as scholars, believe that they would do that because they are so certain of their prophecy that it, that it will come to pass that it's even more accurate than history. So that's possible. So the prophet will use past tense because they are absolutely positive it will be fulfilled, and it was. Now, are these found in the Book of Mormon. Let me give you one or two examples. <clears throat> Lehi declared, I have obtained, see it's past tense, a land of promise. And he said that long before he actually arrived at the promised land. If you've ever wondered about that language, this is from the Bible. This is typical of the Bible. Nephi spoke of Jesus' baptism and reception of the Holy Ghost as though it had already happened. Wherefore, after he was baptized with water, the Holy Ghost descended upon him in the form of a dove. So see, baptized and descended. 
So not only does the Book of Mormon have examples of this prophetic past tense, but it gives us a definition. In Hosea 16, 6, And now if Christ had not come into the world, speaking of things to come as though they had already come, there would be no redemption. So that's prophetic perfect. I hope I explained it okay to you. Let's go to the next one. I, I need to read a quote by a scholar. In 1898, um, a scholar by the name of Bullinger wrote a book called Figures of Speech Used in the Bible. And he came up with some remarkable figures of speech. And I want to tell you about one figure of speech. By the way, you all remember Elder Pinnock. Elder Pinnock and I many, many times discussed these figures of speech. And he liked the figures of speech in the Book of Mormon so much that he, he wrote a book detailing some of the figures of speech, Elder Pinnock. And I bought him, I found him an original edition of the of Bollinger's book in England, and I presented to, presented it to him as leather bound. I think I paid seven or eight dollars, but uh, he really enjoyed that. There's one figure of speech called climax, and I'm going to introduce this to you in just a minute. Bollinger called this quote a beautiful figure, very expressive, and at once attracts our attention to the importance of a passage. He also calls this gradation, kind of like a ladder. You climb up a ladder to reach your goal. So I'm going to just give you one example from the Bible and one example from the Book of Mormon, and just so you can see how expressive this is. Now I, I formatted it so that you can see what, what it does is it repeats a phrase or a word and then repeats another phrase or a word and then another one and then uh, usually there's a climax at the end. So, tell ye, this is from Joel, tell ye your children of it and let your children, see, your children, your ch children, see how it's repeated? Tell their children and their children, so we repeat their children, their children, another generation, that which the palmer worm hath left, hath the locust eaten, and that which the locust hath left, the canker worm, canker worm eaten, and that which the canker worm hath left, hath the caterpillar eaten. And it ends with caterpillar eating. This is a prophecy. I won't explain the value of the prophecy, although it's a very exciting passage once you know how to read this form. Now I'm going to give you one from the Book of Mormon. I'm aware of about eight or ten of these in the Book of Mormon, but I'm just going to give you one because of the time. This is from Moroni 8. Before I read it, notice that baptize, baptism is repeated twice, and the fulfilling of fulfilling commandments and so on. You kind, of, kind of blend. And then I want you to look at the climax at the end. And the first fruits of repentance is baptism, and baptism cometh by faith unto the fulfilling the commandments, and the fulfilling the commandments bringeth remission of sins. And the remission of sins bringeth meekness and lowliness of heart. And because of meekness and lowliness of heart cometh the visitation of the Holy Ghost. Now notice, instead of repeating Holy Ghost, it repeats Comforter. So it breaks the rule a little bit, but it still works. Which Comforter filleth with hope and perfect love, which love endureth by diligence unto prayer. And then notice the climax. You have to go back and study this and see how it's mentioned the, the uh, first principles and ordinances of the gospel that builds upon being meek and lowliness of heart. That, uh, the Holy Ghost is mentioned. Love is vital to this formula. And then in the end, the saints will dwell with God. And that's the climax. So I hope you like this one. I hope you enjoy it. I really do remember. Bollinger calls it, not knowing that they're in the Book of Mormon, a beautiful figure, very expressive, and at once attracts our attention to the importance of a passage. I think it's just remarkable.
that uh, they're found in the Book of Mormon. I really like to study these, and there's a lot to study here. You could spend the full Gospel Doctrine hour on this one passage and come away not knowing all that there is. Let's go to the next one. In the Bible, you have six formulas. You have six expressions, well, I, I, I should say revelatory formulas, six expressions that belong to a prophet. Formulas or phrases that a prophet can state that others may not with authority. And the, they even have, the scholars have given them names. One is called the messenger formula, and the formula is this, thus saith the Lord. So a prophet can say that with authority. Others might try to say that. We have a, a, a false prophet in the book of Jeremiah who tried to say this. In fact, Jeremiah made a prophecy in the king's court in front of a lot of people. And this false prophet came up and followed Jeremiah. Jeremiah said, thus saith the Lord, this is going to happen to you. And the false prophet came right up to Jeremiah's face and said, No, thus saith the Lord, this will not happen. So he contradicted Jeremiah. So what did Jeremiah do? Jeremiah didn't get angry, didn't react. Jeremiah was silent, and he left the court. Jeremiah was, knew that he was uh, a prophet, and he was secure, and he had spoken by the Spirit of the Lord and used this formula, thus saith the Lord, he later meet, met the false prophet and said, Thus saith the Lord, you're going to die. And, and the false prophet met an untimely death within weeks. Not because of Jeremiah speaking as a human, but because the Lord spoke to him. So, thus saith the Lord is a very important formula that the scholars know about, found in the Hebrew Bible. Would we anticipate it would be in the Book of Mormon? Most certainly. And it is found, to my count, 39 times in the Book of Mormon, and I've given you some examples. Now, how would Joseph Smith know to put that in if it was a fraudulent work? And in fact, all of these things, there's no way. Some of these things were not discovered until after Joseph Smith uh, published the Book of Mormon. The previous climax example was discovered, as far as I know, in 1898. That's Here's, I'm just going to give you three formulas. The proclamation formula. Hear the word of the Lord. So this is to the, a prophet. Isaiah, hear the word of the Lord. Ezekiel, hear the word of the Lord. Joel, hear the word of the Lord. And the Book of Mormon, of course, has it in, in similar formats. Hearken to the word of the Lord, Jacob 2. Hear the words of Jesus. Hearken unto the words which the Lord saith. Heal them. And the third uh, formula. It's the oath formula. The Lord God has sworn, or as the Lord liveth, these phrases are found in the Book of Mormon. As the Lord liveth, and elsewhere in the Book of Mormon. So see, these. that's important to recognize that these came out of the ancient biblical world, and the Book of Mormon prophets didn't make them up. Next. Uh, some Book of Mormon scholars at BYU and elsewhere have discovered 10 Book of Mormon names that were not previously known to the world in ancient Hebrew documents. So 10. Uh, subsequent to the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. And here is one example. This is a document that was discovered in 1961 or 1962 by Yigael Yadin, who is a famous Jewish archaeologist. And Professor Yadin discovered in a cave, and I don't know how these sat for so many centuries, he discovered 32 documents that were uh, bound together with a palm frond. And he uncovered them, and they dated from 133 AD, the Bar Kokhba era. So 133, and this is one, and previous to this discovery, some non-Mormon scholars criticized the Book of Mormon because the name Alma, they said, was a girl's name. And they thought Joseph Smith had made an error 
in, in putting uh, Alma as a boy's name, not once, but twice. Two boys identified as Alma. And so in this text, uh, it's written in Hebrew. You notice the little square there, and then we enlarge it. It says, Alma ben Yehuda. Alma, the son of Judah. And it's found down below, too, too if anyone wants to say, well, that they meant Alma, the daughter of Judah. Well, it's found down below. So this is one of the ten names that were discovered, and I'm going to show you about three more in just a minute. Next. Uh, in the Old Testament, let me just note, note something here. Um, cer certain deities in the ancient Near East are celebrated for the multiplicity of their names or titles, as in the 50 names of Marduk. Now these are not our deities, these belong to other religious systems. The 74 uh, <coughs> names of Ray, R E, and the 100 names of Osiris. It, it, it's a long standing tradition for religious systems to give their deities multiple names. In the Old Testament, we have many names of our gods. And I, I put some of them here, there are many more. Let's go to the next one. And here are just a sample of some of the Book of Mormon. There are actually 101 names of deity in the Book of Mormon, which is a remarkable fact, I believe. In fact, Susan Easton Black from BYU counted the names, counted the verses, did some math, and said there is one name of God on the average of once every 1.7 verses. And I've challenged some people to start reading the Book of Mormon to find those names, and they, they get to First Nephi and they're totally convinced. So one name of deity, one name of God, on the average of once every 1.7 verses. Next. Oh, in, in the, did you know Genesis 4:10, where it says, "Thy brother's blood cried unto me from the ground." The word in Hebrew for blood is in the plural. It says blood. But the King James translators and other translators didn't choose to translate bloods because it sounds funny. There's a reason it's blood. Bloods. It's called plural amplification. It's amplifying, emphasizing some kind of doctrine or some fact by putting it in the plural. Here's another example in Isaiah 33, 6. And strength of salvation, the Hebrew has the plural. Strength of salvations. Uh, in Psalm 94, O Lord God, to whom vengeance, and it reads, vengeance is in the Hebrew, belongeth. Wisdom, and the Hebrew reads, wisdoms. Wisdoms crieth about, she uttereth her voice in the streets. That's a personification. In the Hebrew, wisdom is personified as a woman. But, uh, would we find any of these in the book, book of Mormon? Would you anticipate there would be some? Let's look at some examples. I'm, I'm just giving you a few examples. Um, and these, uh, most of these are still in the Book of Mormon, which tells me Joseph Smith gave us a very careful translation. There shall be bloodshed. Now in modern English, we would say bloodshed, I believe. Impenetrable are the understandings. See the plural? of the children of men, and labor with their might. We never say that in English. I'm going to labor with my might. We don't even say labor with our might. Great slaughters with the sword among my people, and it came to pass that there were magics. We'd say there was magic. Destructions of my people, foolish imaginations of his heart. And then notice the footnote here. Uh, the printer's manuscript and the 1830 edition of the Book of Mormon read the plural destructions here, um, but uh, it was altered to read destruction. And uh, many of you heard from Royal, Royal just in the last hour. Royal Scouts, and there's a note to that document. Any questions about plural ampli amplification while we're on the subject? Does that make somewhat sense? I will admit right now that I have I, I presented 
probably about 80 or 100 <coughs> firesides on the Dead Sea Scrolls and Isaiah. And so this is mostly classroom material here. And I don't know uh, how much, uh, how many examples to give you. Let's look at the next example. The usage of of. This does have a, a fancy grammatical term, but we'll just say of. In the Old Testament, they like to use the word of, the word of the Lord, rather than saying the Lord's word. Vessel of wood, rather than wooden vessel. And the same thing is true in the Book of Mormon. Here are four examples. In the Book of Mormon, it's plates of. See, it says plates of brass. That's the way, that's a, a good translation, rather than brass plates. The rod of iron, rather than what we say in our own uh, uh, oh, in, in our own church, we say iron rod, but it, it says rod of iron. <coughs> sword of Laban rather than Laban's sword. Temple of Solomon rather than Solomon's temple. And let's go to the next one. This one's an easy one, and it's just a very brief one. And I like the way she forms that one. The Hebrew repeats the the, the definite article the, throughout. It repeats it. It drives some translators crazy. Some translators don't translate it. We did observe to keep the judgments and the statutes and the commandments of the Lord. When you read the Book of Mormon no, next time, notice all of the thes and how they're repeated. Next. Um, oh, here's a verb and noun sharing the same root. This is very biblical Hebrew. And I've just given you a few examples from the Book of Mormon. So, I will curse, that's the verb, curse them even with a sore curse, and that's the noun. Curse with a curse. So, they share the same root. I have dreamed a dream. Yoke them with a yoke. I will work a great and marvelous work. And we, we don't use that very much in English. Build buildings. This was the desire which I desired of him. Work, all men are fine work. Judge, righteous judgments. Sing the song. That is one that we do use in English. Taxed with a tax. And fear exceedingly with fear. These are found throughout the Bible. Hundreds of examples. But they are not translated literally. They're, they're put into idiomatic English. English that we use today. Especially the Good News Bible. I don't know if you've seen that one. Continue. Many ends. The Book of Mormon, like the Bible, features many ends. It's a characteristic of biblical Hebrew. And Joshua, and all Israel with him. And the silver, and the garment, and the wedge of gold, and his son. See, in English we would say, and the silver, the garment, the wedge of gold, his sons, and so on. But they use all these ands. It's very typical of biblical Hebrew. When we leave this room, I expect most of you to be translating from the Hebrew Bible. And you are going to be quizzed on these things, too. Next, let, let's look at an example. I'm not going to read the whole thing. Look at, I put the ands in the talents. He, he on in 3.14. You see it throughout the Book of Mormon. When you read the Book of Mormon next time and you see the many ands, just think this is a Hebrew thing. And then it'll help you to appreciate the Book of Mormon. I hope. That is my goal. Next. And this is the final repetition item, although I can show you more. The possessive pronoun, our. We will go with our young, and with our old, and our sons, and our daughters, and our flocks, and with our herds. We will go. That's from Exodus. And, and a Book of Mormon exam example. Notice all of your, your wicked ways, your evil doings, your lying and deceiving. That's not the way we speak in English. And I promise that's not the way Joseph Smith spoke. Your priestcrafts, your Indians, and your scribes. We'd say your priestcrafts, Indian scribes, and so on and so forth. Next, please. These are called Hebrew, but uh, these are called seals. S E A L S. And you've heard of seals. Sometimes they're put in the form of a ring. You notice a couple of rings. 
Sometimes they put them on a cord and wore them around the neck. You may remember the seal that Tamar took in Genesis 38 as proof that Judah had slept with her. She took three things. One was his seal. It's very personal because it has their name on it or it has a symbol. And so these are just some examples. These are uh, this, these pictures. These are the real thing. And so I'm going to show you uh, three or four that have Book of Mormon names on them. And which names were unknown to the world at the time Joseph Smith translated the Book of Mormon. So next. This is the name of, I don't know how to say it in English, it's something like Sariah, the wife of Lehi. And her name in Hebrew means, now it sounds like a boy's name, and it actually is, this will surprise you, Jehovah is Prince. Now you've heard of Sarah. Sarah is similar. Sarah means princess. The name Sarah is a feminine name. But Sariah is a boy's name, but don't let that throw you off. There are about six names in the Bible that are shared between boys and girls. And the same is true in English. We have several names that are shared by the two. The name Solomon is also a girl's name in the Bible. And uh, Abiya, or uh, I'm not sure how you say it in English, it's A-B-I-J-A-H. Is a boy's name in one place in the Bible and a girl's name in another place. So that shouldn't bother us. But here's a seal with the name of Sariah on it. Next. This one is obvious, and you read it from right to left. And uh, remember, she was a late night warrior. She was a servant of uh, King Lamoni's, uh, of the queen, as I recall. Next. These three characters are, are uh, translated Aha, A-H-A. Do you remember, remember Aha in the Book of Mormon? One of the sons of Zoram, who was a, a military uh, officer, Nephi. So this is from a seal, and one more. This is the name Josh. A lot of people have thought that in the Book of Mormon, where it has the name Josh, which is one of the names of the cities that was destroyed at the time of uh, Christ's crucifixion, they have said, oh, it's a nickname short for Joshua. And they've said the same about the name Sam. Oh, it's a nickname for the name Samuel. Well, we have found the name Sam uh, and the name Josh, knowing that uh, whether it's a nickname or it's uh, an abbreviated form or whatever, it doesn't matter. It did exist in antiquity. Now, my own name, Don, is... Uh, uh, a short form of Donald, and it reminds me that in high school, up in Idaho, a small high school, someone wrote in my high school senior journal and misspelled the name Don, if you can imagine. And wrote, dear do, D-O, comma, forgot the end, and everyone in high school found out about it, started calling me do, and someone even made a little t-shirt with a funny face that said do on it, for me to wear around it. For a while, that was my name for better or for worse, okay? <laughs> Next. Oh, okay. I'm going to, I, I think I have about eight more minutes. I'm going to conclude and then see if you have any questions. Uh, I've, I've presented about I, uh, eight or 10 peculiar items in the Book of Mormon. There are many, many more. Uh, I produced in a paper 17, just as an example. And I want to now tell you something. Oh, likes, please. Thank you for the likes. And just, uh, to conclude, I want to emphasize that these are really fun, and to me they're very important, these forms, and I enjoy teaching these to my students over the years. But there's something that's much more important than this, and I'm going to read a quotation from one of the early <coughs> brethren. Now, 
This is Willard Richards, an early church convert. Some people might argue and say, well, so what about this? So what if the name Aha was discovered or the name Alma? I don't care. What's more important than that is your personal testimony in the Book of Mormon that is born by the Spirit. So here is a quote from Willard Richards. In the summer of 1835, someone handed him a copy of the Book of Mormon. Quote, he opened the book without regard to place and totally ignorant of its design or contents. He had no idea what was in it. And before reading half a page, declared, God or the devil has had a hand in that book for man never wrote it. <laughs> he read it twice through in about 10 days. And so firm was his conviction of the truth that he immediately commenced selling his accounts, selling his medicine, and freeing himself from every encumbrance that he might go to Kirtland, Ohio, 700 miles west, the nearest point where he could hear a saint, hear of a saint, and give the work a thorough investigation, firmly believing that the doctrine was true. God had some greater work for him to do than pedal pills. And I want to give you one more quote. This is from Harvey P. Pratt. When he read the Book of Mormon, and this, uh, this <coughs> describes, he says, quote, I opened the Book of Mormon with eagerness and read its title page. I then read the testimony of several witnesses in relation to the manner of its being found and translated. After this, I commenced its contents by course. I read all day. Eating was a burden. I had no desire for food. Sleep was a burden. When the night came, for I preferred reading to sleep. As I read, the Spirit of the Lord was upon me, and I knew and comprehended that the book was true. That this discovery greatly enlarged my heart and filled my soul with joy and gladness. I esteemed the book or the information contained in it more than all the riches of the world. Now I want to testify that this has happened millions of times since the coming forth of the Book of Mormon to millions of people who have read its contents. And their hearts have been enlarged, including mine. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Do we have two or three minutes? Or are we out of time?